What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another exciting episode of the Unlockables podcast, the story of video games, the people who play them and the memories made along the way. My name is Eric, your host as always, and I really appreciate you tuning in with us this week, wherever, whenever in time and space you might be located. It's always great for you to stop in and spend just a little bit of time with us each and every week. If it's your first week, that's great. If it's your however many weeks this show's been on the air, also great. Appreciate you tuning in the same no matter what. But enough about that, enough about the boring stuff, because I have a very exciting guest on the show today. Uh, he might be the only man capable of single-handedly evolving an Eevee into a Flareon with his last name alone. It is my good friend, Rick Firestone from Pixel Project Radio. Rick, how are you doing today, man? What's up, Eric? I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I know uh, a little short notice. I apologize, but I appreciate you coming on. I'm, I normally try to be a little bit better about planning these things, but uh, appreciate you coming on all the same. No, dude, it's totally fine. The pleasure is all mine. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm super excited to be here because um, what we'll probably get into just how we first interacted, I'm sure. But you were one of the first people when we started on Instagram uh, that was, you know, really supportive of our show. Wow. And that was it just just as a super auspicious and really kind introduction to the community. So uh, I, I know I've never forgotten that. So I, I wanted to say thank you, man. I, I really appreciate it. I'm I'm so happy and thankful to to be here talking to you. Uh, that's my pleasure. And really, I was just I was just paying it forward from the man who started it all uh, for me, uh, our good friend Keith of Main Quest. Uh, he he was the first one when I first put up episodes of SideQuesting podcast, and I've told, I've said this probably on every episode. He he reached out and he was like, "Hey, I listened to your show and really enjoyed it." And I was like, "There's no way that can be possible because I hate my show." <laughs> so um, <laughs> he, he kind of dragged me in, and I, through him, I kind of met you know everybody that's uh, kind of been synonymous with our little like friend group we got going on. So um, yeah, I, obviously, yeah. As as soon as I had this idea for Unlockables, I, I made like a short list of people I wanted to have on right away, and I was like. Yeah, I got to get uh, Rick, and unfortunately, Ben can't be here with us tonight, but um, I'm going to get him on the next go around for sure. But um, yeah, it's the pleasure is all mine, and I appreciate you taking some time out just to kind of sit down and talk with me. Um, but before we get started, uh, as I think most of the shows in our friend group do, I just kind of wanted to ask you, what have you been uh, playing game-wise lately? Yeah, uh, so <laughs> game-wise... <laughs> Um, mainly, so the, the big game that I've been playing lately has been uh, a game called Xenogears. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a PlayStation 1 RPG that released in, oh, I, I think 1998 is when it released. Um, so that's that's been the biggest thing. I'm, I'm having an absolute ball. Uh, JRPGs have always kind of uh, been my favorite genre and the genre that I gravitate towards the most. So uh, this has been a big blind spot, and I'm really having a great time playing through it um other than that i'm finishing up until dawn for an episode on on our show that we're doing uh that's been a lot of fun that's mm -hmm. great game i especially if you love the sort of campy b horror movies uh just <laughs> such a fun experience yeah i've heard a couple of people talk about that one in our group too and i think uh probably gonna end up on my list playing it as well because i've, I've heard nothing but good things about that uh, in regards to, to xeno gears i have to ask i don't have as much experience with it is that kind of a precursor to the xenoblade chronicles uh series of games or are they completely unrelated i might be ignorant yeah uh, this. no no it's totally fine it's a good question um they're so the first game that came out was Xeno Gears. That mm -hmm. was the first one. It was originally a sort of, it was actually a pitch for what Final Fantasy VII was going to be. It was in development, but they sort of deemed it being a little too dark um, and too involved with things like philosophy and religion and all of that. So um, what ended up happening was they gave them the right to make their own project. Um, Xeno Saga was a spiritual successor, um, and then Xeno, Xeno Blade, Xeno mm -hmm. Blade Chronicles, those are all, um, they're loosely in the same universe, but they're not really, uh, you don't need to play the first Xeno Gears to understand any of the rest of them, you know what I mean? Yeah, I originally, the only one of, of that kind of, I guess, Xeno... I don't I guess you can't really call it like a franchise saga of games kind of was I played Xenoblade Chronicles 2 because I'd heard how great the first one was uh, but by the time I wanted to play it it, it kind of wasn't available it was really hard to find it was considered a rare game on the Wii 
until the HD collection came out, which now I don't really have an excuse to not play it. Uh, but I played Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and, um, you know, that was that was fun. It was a little weird, uh, just considering how, I guess, lack of a better term, Japanese it was. It's a very Japanese game. But, um, yeah, I, I've definitely been meaning to like, kind of go back. And even, yeah, I've heard you and, and a couple other people talk about Xenogears, so I think that's something I definitely need to go back to do and, and play that, because I'm... I'm the same too. Those those early kind of late '90s, early 2000s JRPGs have a really big influence on me. I mean, that's kind of how uh, to kind of tie that into is kind of how I found your show. Was I don't even remember. I, I just saw it on the off chance, or maybe we just started following each other on Instagram because when you start doing the podcast game, you just kind of start following people just to see who will follow you back. And um, <laughs> yeah. I saw you guys like do your ad for you had you were doing like a big series on Final Fantasy IX, and I was like. Oh, well, that's like one of my favorite games of all time. So that's a no brainer. I, I got to listen to that. And that's kind of how I started listening to you guys and was, um, you know, you've been in my rotation pretty much ever since that that time. So and that I, that was relatively early on. I, I'm mixing the segments now because we're supposed to be talking about games, but I'm mixing that with, with what's coming next. <laughs> but um, that's kind of that was a little bit earlier in the show's lifetime, wasn't it? With you guys were doing that. Um. Yeah, it was it was definitely earlier. Um, I believe Final Fantasy IX we did as a three parter in July. Um, that was back when we had a third uh, co host, um, Vince. And oh, yeah. you know he's yeah no Vin, Vince is great. He he stepped away um, just because of um, you know scheduling things. Mm-hmm. But that was it. It was interesting to try and cover a game that large with three people all with differing schedules in one month it was it was really something yeah i can um, imagine <laughs> definitely one of my favorite games of all time though um mm-hmm. and you know if you're if you're looking for that sort of 90s ps1 pinnacle jrpg experience like xeno xeno gears is going to give it to you i, I was awesome. hooked within the first hour it was like and what's interesting too is like um they have it, it's got a very fascinating development history but they've got uh cut scenes that are anime like early 90s oh, style anime wow um kind of like cowboy bebop aesthetic that's super it's like very that's cool. like peak like dragon ball z too like that era that's that's yeah. very cool yeah that's very synonymous with my childhood so i think i definitely need to check that out um yeah gonna toss that one on the list for sure uh for myself uh really the only thing i've been playing this week was uh a game by a, a little pink ball that you guys may have heard of uh kirby in the forgotten land uh, pick that up check that out pretty fantastic it's enjoyable i wouldn't say it's anything to like the scales of you know the elden rings that have just recently come out but it's been an enjoyable experience it's a nice relaxing charming uh like nintendo kirby adventure and you know sometimes after you play some of these gigantic games that's kind of what you need in life so uh that's been awesome i would highly recommend picking that up if if you know anyone's listening it's just kind of on the fence about it i would highly recommend picking it up i've always had kind of a softer spot for kirby in my life um he's i've held him in is like high regard as link and mario which maybe some people think me crazy um and i even told a couple people too and they asked me how it was i said this is personally my favorite kirby game since superstar back on the snes so um and they're like oh that's pretty high praise but i i think it's that i think it's that good so uh, that's just kind of what I've been playing. Um, you have any intentions of picking that up at all, or? Uh, you know, I I'm not sure. I I actually haven't played any Kirby game since. Um, oh gosh, I think Kirby's Dream Land Two on the Game Boy. Wow, that's that that's a long time ago. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm showing my age on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I've played them intersparsely here and there um like i said i I love superstar on this nest that kind of collection of kirby games that uh nightmare in dreamland is one of the peak kirby experiences on the game boy advance but just everything since then has kind of been just weird i mean kirby epic yarn uh rainbow curse where he's like a ball of clay just kind of weird stuff that they've been doing with them it's kind of and i played the last iteration of the switch star allies which was just not very inspiring at all so kind of happy to see him come back into a game that's that's really good really strong here uh some of nintendo's other mascots metroid dread having a good time and hopefully you know this kirby game has a good time too so um yeah that's kind of kind of everything that i've been doing so
guess we'll just dive into it now since we already said it, kind of started touching on it. So, um, Rick, you host the show uh, Pixel Project Radio is, is your podcast. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to ask you, what are the origins of that show? How did you guys come up with that idea? Um, also, the name, which is a super sick name. I, I love it, by the way. And what was kind of the epic origin of, you know, Rick and Ben, you get you guys hosting the show together? Yeah, sure. So, um, just hmm. all so, the questions at once. <laughs> <laughs> as hey, as they should be. They're all great questions. Um, back in uh, 2020, you know, at the start of this whole wonderful pandemic, um, it's been great. <laughs> Jeez, you're telling me. Um, so I, I was actually in school during this time. Um, I was finishing up my uh, one of my graduate degrees. And I, I this was a time, you know, everything was closed down. Nothing uh, was going on. We weren't uh, we weren't having any performances or anything. And I, I was feeling creatively sort of starved. So I was like, you know, how can I. Uh, how how can I be involved in creating something during this uh, time period that is sort of like a, a an artistic desert? And mm -hmm. I, I put together a podcast called uh, Firestone Side Chats, which does not exist anymore. I have scrubbed that <laughs> from, <laughs> from the internet, um, as far as I never know to anyway. be heard again. <laughs> Hopefully, um, <laughs> and uh, basically, what I was doing was I was just interviewing. Um, a lot of my friends in the classical music scene, uh, just about classical music stuff and their uh, personal lives and things of that nature. And uh, I, I found out that I really loved podcasting. Um, and for one reason or another, I, I wanted to start a show that was not related to classical music. Um, just based on your questions, I think we might end up getting into that as we uh, go farther down the, the line here. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> so I I knew that I, I've always been a huge fan of video games and I knew that Ben and our friend Vince both were as well. So I, I just had the idea. I was like, hey, why don't uh why don't we start a video game podcast? You know, what's what could go wrong? You know? And we <laughs> ended up recording a few episodes, and turns out we really liked it. So um yeah, that's that's kind of the the origins there. It's nothing nothing too crazy and nothing too um, epic, <laughs> to use your word. But it's you know <laughs> it was COVID brought a lot of negativity and wreaked a lot of habit ha havoc. Excuse me, um, mm -hmm. wreaked a lot of havoc. But one thing that I'm thankful for is it 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 brought rise to a lot of creative pursuits that I think folks otherwise wouldn't have gone after and uh in in some ways this our show is a pro is a is a product of that so mm -hmm. yeah um ben and i met in school and undergrad vince and i roomed together in grad school that's how we met um and what was your third question the show's name yeah the show's name it uh I'm really bad at coming up with names for things. <laughs> I don't know if you can relate at all. Um, uh, not, not terribly. My, um, that's one of my curses is that's, uh, things I'm always thinking about because I went to business school for, for marketing. So part of like my educational training was coming up with just clever names or stupid names for things all the time. Uh, so it's something I'm just constantly doing on a, on a regular basis. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I get you. I get you. Um, well, I, I, I am not that way. <laughs> I am not quite as, <laughs> as good at coming up with names. Um, this, this has been something that I've dealt with all through school. Whenever we've done quartets and chamber groups, it's just mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm really terrible at coming up with names, but I threw a <laughs> bunch of them at the wall at, uh, Vince and, and Ben and pixel project were, were, what was a string of words that I liked. I just liked the ring of, I liked how mm -hmm. they felt in coming out of the mouth and off of the tongue. I didn't know what plosives were at the time, so I didn't know that that would be an issue <laughs> at some point. <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, and then, you know, I one of the last chamber groups that I was in was a reed quintet, um, just a quintet of wind instruments. And, you know, you, you there are so many groups that are like, whatever, whatever, string quartet, whatever, whatever, 
clarinet quartet or, you know, whatever, whatever, insert the name of whatever they are here. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, it's fine, but it's just, you know, needs more pizzazz. So I was like, we can't just call ourselves Pixel Project Podcast. Um, and so I was like, well, Ben's dad worked in radio. And this is kind of a callback to Ben's dad, as well as, you know, the podcast evolving out of broadcast radio. So I was like, what about Pixel Project Radio? It sounds better than PPP, you know, PPR. PPP mm -hmm. is alone. We don't want yeah. people to get confused. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I think, I actually think I pitched that one. And then I think maybe Welcome Weary Podcaster was another one. And I was like, hey, which one do you guys like more? And they were like, eh. We don't really like either. I was like, okay, Pixel Project <laughs> like, Radio guys. it is. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks, man. I, I am glad to hear that we came up with a name that's, you know, that people like. <laughs> I, I, it's catchy. And for me, I love alliteration. So the, the, two, the two Ps at the, at the start, that's, that's great. It's very pleasing. Yeah, except for the, the plosives, you know. Um, but you, that's something you don't really read about or discover until you're actually doing the podcast and it's like oh my audio audio is just peaking terribly now and there's nothing i can do about it um that's awesome so he his dad was in was in radio was that like a like a local kind of radio thing in in town or um yeah it was in it was in pittsburgh um so that was i'm not sure the station or anything but it okay. was a local radio station in pittsburgh that's cool. Back in the day when that was much more relevant than it is today. But it seems to me, too, and uh, just uh, you know, talking to you and talking to a couple other people as well. Out of all of the terrible things that happened during the pandemic, it, it did seem that it led a lot of people to uh, pursue some of these different creative, creative outlets like podcasting and podcasting. Uh, definitely easier. E this is the easiest podcasting ever any for anybody to get into that's ever been. Uh, you know, if anybody's listening, thinking about doing it and you're just kind of intimidated by it, I'm stupid. I th I think I'm not that smart and I can do it. So if, if I can do it, you can definitely do it. There's a host of great tools, people out there willing to, to teach you and show you. So um, highly recommend it. And yeah, that that's one thing that too I'm thankful for is that we, can, we it seems like we kind of all got into it at the same time. We were just kind of looking for something to do during the pandemic when there just wasn't really anything else to do. And, you know, we ended up kind of finding and creating this community of people that talk about video games on the Internet. And now we're just all kind of kind of friends and, and hang out in Discord servers and stuff. So uh, I think that's definitely. You know, out of a dark moment in, in time came came something good. So is that, uh, that is I that think, when when you started your podcasts in, during the pandemic? Yes. So I, I kind of have a similar arc as you. I, I started I had an original show that I had a few years ago that uh, hasn't been entirely scrubbed. Apparently, it's still up on Spotify. But I I've tried to get them to take it down, and it just doesn't go away for whatever reason. <laughs> so, um, and then I, I originally started that with Tom and, and one other person, and then Tom and I started SideQuesting Podcast. It, as just kind of a, we knew we wanted to come back to it. It just so happened that, like, the pandemic had been, like, started, and it just kind of coincided with that because Tom and I met when we were both trying to become, you know, the, the Twitch streamer stars and make the money that way. Cause that was the dream is to sit at home and oh, play video games and not have to work. Yes. And so Tom and I met through that and, and Tom still streams um, a lot and we're, we're kind of just on a break with the side questing stuff, but we just liked getting talking about video games. So we were just like, yeah, let's just like do a podcast because I, I've done a couple and, and then this project kind of spun off of that as something and a creative endeavor that I wanted to pursue on my own so yeah similar kind of arc to, to the way you guys did um although tom and i tom and i have never officially met in person though so uh he he, he lives uh, out east and i'm kind of stuck here in uh, the midwest so maybe, maybe one day maybe one day when things are better <laughs> where where um, at in the midwest are you if, if you don't mind sharing on air i moved back um i was doing school in kansas city and i moved okay. back uh, to pennsylvania from there okay uh, yeah, I'm I'm in uh, Northwest Indiana, uh, I'm, and I'm I'm pretty confident that people won't try and find me and kill me. Hopefully, but uh, I, I'm in Northwest Indiana. I'm like right by the border of Illinois, Indiana. I grew up in Illinois, and um, when my wife and I got our house, we got out of that state because it's kind of a dumpster fire, and moved into Indiana. Uh, more econ it's better economically stable for like starting a family and stuff. So yeah, um, I've I've been in like the south side of Chicago, northwest Indiana, like suburbs. Like that's that's been my whole life. And I went to 
I went and to school at uh, U of I in Chicago downtown. So, oh, um, okay, yeah. So that's that's kind of about me where I've been a little bit. So, got my first two questions. So, I was kind of like perusing your backlog of your your episodes, uh, and you guys kind of you guys talk about a lot of different things in in a lot of your episodes. You talk about uh you know different genres uh like wider topics like music and video games you, you talk about specific video games um do, how do you decide on a, like a episode to episode basis like what you want to talk about do you lean towards more about talking about specific games do you lean towards more talking about like wider genres do you kind of have like a direction you're you're moving forward with that or yeah uh great question so one of the things that I think a lot of us that are currently podcasting uh, can relate to is that, you know, we're not paid, obviously. <laughs> um, and with it, that that's sort of a double-edged sword because on one hand, you know, a- a- anybody that's creating art of any kind should be paid if, if they can, if they can help it. Um, so I, I feel that strongly, but you know, that's not always feasible. So, but the other, the other side of that is since we're not getting paid, we can decide whatever we want to do. Right. Like we don't we don't have the obligations of people that are giving their hard earned money and time uh, to our show. So that we just nice. talk yeah. about whatever we want, you know, and it's mm-hmm. that's that's why recently we've had like we, we start the show each episode with um, like a, a really mini review and a number out of 10 rating. And, you know, the numbers are super arbitrary. It, it's just kind of a way for us to gauge like how we felt about it in our own personal, um, you know, tastes and such. But you know, lately it's just been a string of games that we've really enjoyed. And I was talking with Ben, I was like, you know, since we're picking these games, we're not going to pick real stinkers. You know, it's not, we're not (laughs) going to intentionally play games that we think we're not going to like. That's Um, no fun. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So we, we really kind of just approach it that way. It's what do we want to talk about and what works with our schedules? Um, So if Ben if Ben's got a particularly busy month coming up, then, you know, I know not to throw a particularly challenging game that he's never played and vice versa. So it's, it's very pragmatic. Um, it's, it's, it's very practical. Yeah. I didn't, you know, the, the not making money thing is not so cool, but the freedom to be able to discuss what you want to talk about when you want to talk about it is, is nice. And, um, that's something I, I, enjoy about doing this endeavor it's like i'm just able to ask whoever to come on and just just kind of talk about games and talk about what they love to do so um and i, and I really like to uh you mentioned like at the top of your show you guys kind of do a mini review and you and you score the game i used to have a really hard line stance on scoring games out of like 10 because like you said a number is is an arbitrary kind of thing but as i've kind of talked to people and as i've kind of thought about it you know humans are weird kind of creatures like we don't really know what we want or what we think or at any given time so and no, scoring with a number is like not perfect but it does help to kind of you know numbers are like a, a quantitative thing that you can have a frame of reference and they're easy to compare to so i've kind of softened my stance a little bit on that and so like it helps describe a game to like another person so and and I'm kind of with you too. Like if we're talking about like um our favorite albums or our favorite, you know, pieces of literature or plays or whatever, you know, saying, Oh, it's a real eight out of ten, it that doesn't mean anything. So I'm I'm one hundred percent with you. It's the way that we were thinking of it is like, you know, uh I am not, for example, I'm not a big first person shooter guy. So if we were to review a first person shooter and I'm like, I love this game, it's like a, it's like a nine out of 10 that signals to the listener. Okay. This person that is not necessarily hip to that genre loves this game. Maybe I should listen further or, um, you know, subsequently, um, oh, he, you know, he doesn't like this JRPG but he's really into that genre. So, you know, maybe listen with a grain of salt, you know, that kind of thing. It's, um, I, I always think the best reviews are, are subjective, (laughs) you know, and I, I know a lot of people online, angry gamers, TM do not agree with that, but you know, if a reviewer is not saying their truth and saying what they believe according to their taste, that's not a review that I want to listen to. It's, it's just not. Right. And it's difficult for, it's difficult to kind of be 
um, like you said, you you tie your score to like what your likes are and what you think about the game. And you also kind of tie it to like what your experiences are as well. It's hard for if you're reading a giant publication like like your IGNs or your game spots or whatever, where their job is to kind of like objectively review a video game like that person's still a human being. Like that person still has things going on in their life. So, you know, their eight out of 10 might be laden with, you know, problems at home or problems at work or, you know, their six out of 10 might be affected by like their current mental state or something, or everybody has different tastes too. Like not everybody's going to enjoy the same thing all the time. So, you know, my eight out of 10, your eight out of 10, like might mean two completely different things. So it, it really is, you know, the best way to kind of look about it is, yeah, I think the scores are great to like kind of review and it, it creates an educational discussion around video games. And it kind of helps you make decisions as a consumer too, because, you know, for the most part, that score is, I would say helpful in, in making those decisions is my kind of rambling <laughs> point about scores comes to a close here. So <laughs> no, I know exactly what you mean. I, I'm with you. I'm with you, buddy. I, yeah, yeah. Well said. Yeah. So in your experience doing the podcast, you guys have been going for about, uh, it's, it was your birthday recently. So one year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Technically, Technically, the 31st is when I clicked publish, um, okay. but everything was edited, recorded, like the the social medias were all ready to go on the 30th. We just waited until the next day because I think it ended up being like I didn't want to publish for the first time at like 6 p.m. <laughs> so we just <laughs> yeah. waited until the next day. Um, but yeah, Super. yeah, we've officially crossed that one year barrier. Six Very random, like 6 p.m. on a random weeknight, very, very random time to put up a podcast for sure. <laughs> but that's amazing. Uh, I would say a lot of shows, including my, my first endeavor, which will be coming back, uh, didn't even make it uh, a year. And a lot of shows don't. A lot of great people that I used to listen to starting this journey didn't make it. So that, that's that's really awesome. And I feel like once you get past a year, then you're just you're just off to the races. So in that first year that you guys kind of been doing this. I like to ask this question. Everybody comes on. Is there anything you've kind of learned about uh, your taste in gaming in general? Um, have you had, did you have any like preconceived notions or opinions that have been like challenged? Did you have any games that you liked that you kind of like reevaluate your thoughts on? Because I found in my experience podcasting and like meeting our group of friends and meeting other people that, you know, specialize in modern games and retro games and just kind of everything in between the way I kind of think about and approach games now is, is different than I used to two years ago. And I, I kind of think about that in a different light after having done this now for, you know, it, it would have been a year last December, but now doing this show and having done side questing, I kind of think about things differently. Have you experienced anything like that? Yes. And I, I'm glad that you, um, I'm glad that you mentioned just how you're, you're approaching games differently now, because I very much am too. Um, and, you know, it's partly due to the podcast, but uh, something that I've said before is like, you know, when it when it comes to music and, you know, writing, I, I've always been, you know, I, I approach that with a critical eye. But video games for a very long time for me have been just, you know, do I like it or do I not? OK, fine. It's it's turn your brain off and let's let's have a party. Right. It's it's mm -hmm. not something that I was super thinking about. Um, <laughs> and the example that I always give is Detroit Become Human. Um, apologies to fans of Quantic Dream. But when I first played <laughs> that game, I, I just I didn't think about it. I was like, oh, so good. So flashy. So pretty. And then once we started talking about the podcast, I started like reexamining things Um and actually, even before that, it was actually it was actually after I played Disco Elysium for the first time, I started thinking about games more critically. And I was like, oh, good. Quantic Dream sucks. <laughs> like, this is just not good. <laughs> this, this is just the sloppiest writing I've ever seen. But um, the podcast has helped a lot because it's it, it's giving me and I think I can speak for Ben, too, here. It's giving us a new appreciation with which to approach these games looking at it not just from you know a casual through a casual lens but through a critical one as well and having that verb set and those tools to appreciate and criticize games both good and bad um as works of art it it it, it just adds i don't know i i think you'll know what i mean and agree but it adds kind of a new layer um of enjoyment even when a game is not particularly good it's it adds a new enjoy layer of enjoyment to to consuming these works do you know what i mean like do you do you feel the same thing 
Yeah, I do. I gaming, as I kind of talked about on my previous episode with with Morgan, well, we kind of touched on the social aspect of gaming, and that's kind of what it used to be for me for a long time. I was just playing whatever my friends were. Because that was just another way for me to kind of hang out with, interact with them. And a lot of my friends are, are kind of scattered to the winds now. And that was a way that we were able to, to still kind of all get together. And yeah, I would just mostly drift and gravitate towards the biggest, flashiest thing that was coming out. Because that's kind of what I thought gaming was. But after starting this show and, you know, having the time to talk with Tom and all the games that he played. And then, you know, like listening to you guys and everybody else. That was kind of the catalyst that started this adventure that I'm on with Unlockables was, you know, very much the art aspect of video games because, you know, alongside like traditional art like music and painting and all that stuff and more modern mediums like television and movies, I, I video games are very much in that conversation for me as as works of art. And, you know, it's been corporatized so much to the point where it's just like this thing we consume now and it's just like it's like anything else. But I, I'm trying to explore with this show the things that I've learned doing podcasting, the emotional connections behind the games that people play, and uh, just kind of appreciating things more than just running into that building and and kill everybody on the enemy team. Like it's a lot, it's a lot more than that, and that's kind of the things that I've taken away, which is why I've really enjoyed having you and all the guests I've had on so far, just to kind of talk about because um, everybody does really fantastic shows about games, and everybody does really great analysis and and, and that, all that sort of stuff but i just wanted to get people to come on and say hey like just what does it mean to you what does your favorite game mean to you what is that emotional connection and you know why are you doing the things that you do and that's really this what i'm doing now is like the culmination of all all that i hope that's not too long-winded but that's kind of the, the long answer <laughs> no 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 it's not long-winded at all and i'm i'm 100 with you i'm i'm glad that you said that it um Oh, what what is it that she said? Um, that that uh, you know, appreciating video games as an a, a, as a, a true and very concrete form of art because they very much are. It's it it is an amalgamation and a synthesis of of all of these other art forms: music, writing, graphic design, computing, and then you add in this element of consumer agency, right? Like we get to dictate how the art progresses. And that is, mm. you don't, it is a, tr it, it, it is a wholly unique experience, right? You could maybe argue, I suppose, that you get some of that same experience, you know, sitting in an orchestra or being in a stage play. And I, that's fair. I'm not going to argue against that as, as somebody that's done that many times. It's fantastic. Everybody should. Um, mm. But video games are far more accessible than that for better or for worse. So I, it's, I don't get the argument when people say video games aren't true art because they inevitably will say Fortnite, Call of Duty. <laughs> and it's like, that's like saying films aren't art and saying um, Norbit and Nutty Professor, you know, to pick on those two movies. <laughs> it's, it's just not a fair criticism at all. Right. Even the money printing crossover machine Fortnite, I, I would, s there's still elements of art in there, even though I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't call it the most refined thing. I would say it's more it's more for consumer consumption, definitely, which is all the ultimate end goal of everything that we seem to do is is consumption. But yeah, <laughs> capitalism. I, I, exactly. Uh, everyone that everyone that listens to this show is going to think I'm like anti-capitalist and, and want to throw me out of the country. So that's great. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I kind of experienced this midway through college where the one game where I still think of to this day where I think about it is, uh, have you ever heard of or experienced a game called Child of Light by Ubisoft at all? That sounds familiar, but I can't say that I've actually played it. Yeah, it's it, it's a shorter game. It's one of my favorite things that they put out, and it's a really unique thing that they've put out in the last like 10 years because Ubisoft has just pretty much been the Assassin's Creed and um, what's that other one they do? Far Cry people right that's like pretty much all and tom clancy whatever you know slapping his name on everything making him roll over in his grave <laughs> uh but they did a game they did like a, a traditional um like turn-based rpg game called child of light in like the mid 2010s and that game what is like something i always point to people as like an argument for video games as a work of art because 
it's got this almost kind of watercolor paint style graphic style to it it's it's really gorgeous it's like a living painting almost it's it's stunning and the music is just so beautiful these piano melodies in in this game and the most unique thing about the game is everything is spoken in like poetic rhyme it's like poetry so the way the very way the game is written is like poetic and it's got like incredible like themes of like good versus evil and it's just on this beautiful painted background with this beautiful writing and I, that i constantly tell people if, if you get a chance to like pick it up and experience it child of light it, it's it's a beautiful game it, it's not it's certainly not without its faults but it's it's something that to this day even though it's it, it, it shocks me that it came out of ubisoft with how just corporatized and sequelized everything that they do is so I, I if anyone's listening i would highly recommend picking that up for sure that's that's a that's a crazy one it's it's so good it's a hell of a recommend recommendation, man. I I'm with you. I when I think of Ubisoft, I think of just pumping out a, a AAA game on schedule because that's just what they have to do um, for at the behest or sake of like creativity and mm-hmm. uh, you know you know what I'm saying. Uh, but yeah, it's, I'm like gonna, said, I'm it's, gonna it's give it's that weird a shot. That it came out of there. I, yeah, let me know what, if you do. Let me know what you think. Um, it's yeah, it's weird to think that something like that came out of that studio, especially now with you know all the problems they've been having with just everything. That would be like you know Activision Blizzard putting out something that's like a masterful work of art that redefines everything we know. So not not that that was, not that that was like that level, but it was it was very good. So, um, so when you have people come and listen to the show and they kind of come and talk to you. What is something that you want them to take away from listening to an episode of your show? Yeah, I think so. One, one, one things. No, no, that's okay. I I love it. I live (laughs) there. I live there. One thing, you know, that we've already talked about is just this notion that, you know, game games are an art form, right? And it's okay to play games that you know maybe aren't as deep like Fortnite or rocket league um you know i i love rocket league but it's you know it's it's not exactly the deepest game ever but um (laughs) i i i want one for sure for people to come away knowing that you know this this is a legitimate art form and it deserves critique and respect in in the form of these discussions that's number one number two and this is something that I think about a lot is that it's okay to criticize good games and it's okay to talk critically about all art, even if, and perhaps especially if it's good art, right? It, it's, you know, I, I, I know there have been reviewers in the past um, thinking this is recency bias because I just watched a video of theirs today, James Stephanie Sterling, you know, mm-hmm. a, a game will come out, a triple A just smash hit and they won't give it a 10 out of 10 and gamers TM will just go bananas and go ballistic. And that is not conducive to a productive discussion about any kind of art, right? Like any art has its fair share of critiques. One of my favorite symphonies of all time is the second symphony by Charles Ives. Mm -hmm. And I I think it's a masterpiece, but it has very valid and very fair criticisms. A lot of people do not and did not like his use of uh, American folk themes and particularly his growing love of dissonance. And that is okay. I, it doesn't change how I experience it, but it's a valid criticism. And I, I think more than anything, I want people to take that away from our show too. You know, even talking about games that I, I think are true for me, 10 out of 10 perfect experiences like Disco Elysium that has its fair share of, of critiques and whether or not you agree with them is a totally different discussion entirely, but you know, it's, it's okay to be critical of quote unquote, triple a games. Um, disco is not that, but, um, I don't know, super Mario odyssey, let's say it's okay to be critical of those games. It's fine. And it makes you a better, uh, consumer and appreciator of art when you do take part in those discussions. So that's, that's something that I, since from the start have hoped people, uh, took away from our show. Rick, you can't hate the thing that I love. How dare you? 
It, that's that, unacceptable. That's the ubiquitous experience on the <laughs> internet. It's like, you don't like what I like. You're an idiot. Goodbye. Exactly. That's the darker parts of Twitter. When you get dragged down there, sometimes it's not, not that enjoyable. It's easy to do that whenever you're just like an anonymous profile picture. It really is. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> but I, I agree with you hundred percent. That's something I've definitely taken from your show. It's something I've tried to think about as well. It's something I have thought about as well, because some of my favorite games of all time are some of the weirdest games of all time. I, I love, yep. I love Kingdom Hearts undeniably. Like I'll defend that game to the game. I, to the day I die for whatever reason, but you know, listening to shows like yours and having the conversation, I can love something, but I can also admit that it does have faults and shortcomings. The writing and the voice acting in that game, in those games, are super cringy. It's it's sometimes difficult to, to listen to. And, and you know, the, the voice acting is, is not what I would call stellar by any means. I still love that game very much. Uh, I love Final Fantasy IX very much. But I do admit that there are things about that game that could be done better. That doesn't mean that you don't like them. That doesn't mean that you can't enjoy something and also find fault in it. And I think that's... That's the biggest problem when having these conversations, especially like so with the 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 capital G gamers TM, uh, the G Fuel generation. Uh, <laughs> not to knock on G Fuel. I'm sorry, G Fuel. If you, I'll, I'll still sponsor you if you want to. Just send me some. It's fine. It is yeah. The the lack of be, not being able to have these critical, just just critical conversations around around things because going back to our conversation about scores. Uh, I would argue, you know, to give anything a, a 10 out of 10 does not mean that thing is perfect by any means. It Everything has flaws, I believe. Breath of the Wild. I love Breath of the Wild. It's a fantastic game. The weapon durability thing sucks. That really, I, I mean, that that I can, I can see where people come from. That doesn't mean that I enjoy that game any less. Uh, I'm sure even Elden Ring, for all of its incredible accolades that it's inevitably going to win this year, has its flaws and has its issues. So... That's something that we definitely need more of, I think. We need to find a way to have civil discourse and civil constructive conversations about things that we love because when we do, it can enhance everyone's understanding and, and make everybody better, I think. Oh, one hundred percent about it. One hundred percent. Um, although I will say I I do think Disco Elysium to me is a perfect game. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I, that's fine. But that's just personal. You know, when I when I said earlier that like the best reviews are subjective, um, mm -hmm. th this kind of brought me back to that and reminded me it's like taking voice acting, for example, if we were going to have voice acting, you know, on one end, Final Fantasy X, um, which, you know, had a host of problems that contributed to it <laughs> being what it ended up being, um, not 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 knocking the oct the geez, listen to me, not knocking <laughs> the actors uh, necessarily. But if that's at one end and like. I don't know, Danganronpa V3 is at the other end um, in terms of like great voice acting. It's easy to tell like, okay, one is just different quality, but there are so many shades of gray in between that we can have meaningful critical discussions on. Um, I don't know, something that jumps into my mind are like the Fallout series or uh, the Witcher series where it's like, you know, some people might take to those voice acting uh some people might take to those games voice actings a little bit differently and that's that's where that that's where that meaningful criticism comes from it's 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 from taste you know it's anybody can tell when a game is just not working or is buggy or something isn't thought through that's not fun to talk about or meaningful because we all know it it's the the meaningful criticism comes in those shades of gray when it's like oh eric just made a point that i would have never thought of i think i do agree with that actually <laughs> Thank you, Eric. And then it's like, that's that's meaningful, right? No, you can't. You can't ever change your opinion. You have to hold strong and not listen to anything outside of out of your echo chamber. <laughs> uh, that's what the Internet. I, would, that's what the Internet would have you believe. I see you're taking the same stance that my hometown takes on science. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I'm not going to touch that one at all. For yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Uh. I did research on it. It's like, no, you just Googled your opinion to get validation. Like, go, go away, please move up, move along. <laughs> so, um, that's awesome. So what do you have one year into the show? Do you have any kind of more plans for it in the future? I mean, um, 
I left a question from Morgan on there. I apologize. <laughs> I just copied it over and then started changing some of the questions to kind of save me time. But uh, man, bad podcast host over here. Um, so yeah, what do you what do you uh, have any more plans for the show in the future to kind of maybe do a couple different things? You kind of just kind of plan to stick with the the current format of the show. Yeah. So uh, hmm, that's a good question. We we've really liked doing the audience interaction. So like we've done two polls up to this point, um, mm-hmm. a horror game poll that Ben organized back in October and a summer JRPG poll that I organized a couple months ago. And that sort of determined what games that we were going to have on our schedule. Uh, we both oh, agreed that we cool. really, really, really like that. Um, you know, we certainly, we like picking what we want to talk about, but this is mm-hmm. just, an added way to get new perspectives, new games that we otherwise may not have uh, chosen. Excuse me, and and the like. So we're for sure going to do more of that. Um, otherwise, you know, hey, we we've we've settled in, I think, to a format that we both really like. Um, it, the way that it's been set up is our. Uh, bringing guests onto the show has been somewhat inconsistent just because we plan our schedule. Like, like we're planned out through December at this point in terms of what we're talking about. So it's like, it, it makes it a little bit difficult to bring people on because when we bring people on our philosophy of inviting guests on is we want to highlight the guest and make them shine. Right. And it's tough Mm -hmm. to do that if we're saying, Hey, we're talking about, you know, Bubsy 3D, Fester's Quest, and Gex. <laughs> like, what do you want to talk about? And it's like no human Stellar games. has played those <laughs> other than like me and Keith probably. <laughs> Sh- I believe Fester's out. Quest is coming up on his show soon, so that should be fun. I his you know his his repertoire of games never fails to <laughs> catch my attention. Um, but do, that's so that's one thing that we'd like to do more is have more guests on. Um, we've obviously we've been working around it. Um, I mean, you know that certainly. So mm-hmm. it's just a matter of scheduling. Um, but, you know, and you, <laughs> the question that you left in for Morgan is streaming. Um, I don't stream. I stream like once every few months mm-hmm. because once every few months I'll get the itch and I'll be like streaming sounds fun and then I'll do it. And it's like it's you know, this isn't for me. Um, I would rather stream in like discord where it's, you know, just far Absolutely. more casual, but, um, yeah. So, so no streaming from <laughs> pixel project radio, unless Ben decides to pick up that hobby. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that's about where, where we're sitting. Um, you know, and, and it's interesting. I'm, I'm glad you asked it because you, you pivoted your format pretty, um, I mean, not heavily, but you, you pivoted enough to, to be of note going from side questing to unlockables. Like, did mm. you, did you have an impetus behind that? Or like, what was, what was the desire to switch up the format in the way that you did? You may have talked yeah. about this on an earlier episode and I apologize if you did. That's I'm not fine. quite caught up with every single episode just yet. That's fine. I, I kind of like, that was kind of the purpose of episode zero, but even, even in episode zero, I kind of didn't really, like I kind of laid out my train of thought, but I didn't really commit to anything. And and having people on has kind of made me focus more on certain aspects of things I wanted to do. But at the time when when Tom and I decided to to, to put side questing on hiatus, uh, it was just a really really crazy kind of period of our life. I was my wedding was like two months away. Uh, you know, Tom was dealing with a lot of of work stuff related to to COVID. So, um, you know, and, and he was getting ready to move. So just just tons of life stuff that got in the way. And um, the last couple of episodes of side questing, I was I was kind of just going at it by myself just to try and get stuff out. Um, and I discovered that I kind of wanted to try and do something on my own solo uh, separate from side questing is just kind of like a, a really like a thing for me to kind of practice speaking better and learning how to interview people and just work on some of my skills personally, but also explore just kind of this other side of gaming that I've, I'd been thinking about because mine and Tom's whole idea for side questing was just very informal. It was just a couple of friends get together and just kind of shoot the shit for lack of a better word about, about video games and the things that we love, which is why, uh, you know, the joke I always say is we only ever talked about three video games is persona five, Kingdom Hearts and, and Final Fantasy. That was the only games we ever talked about for 50, for 50 you, episodes. You could do a lot worse than those three. <laughs> you could, you could. Um, 
but yeah, and I just kind of wanted to experiment trying to do something on on my own because uh, it, it's a totally different dynamic when you have a host. Uh, and Tom is one of the best hosts because compared to me, he is just such, such a font of knowledge and his knowledge of video games is absolutely incredible and allowed me to do what I think I do best is to help like drive conversation. But I just kind of wanted to explore something on my own to see because I had always... You know, listen to a, a show again, like like Keith's show, uh, and he he does his whole whole thing solo. So I just wanted to see like what that aspect of it was, and this allows me a lot more flexibility to kind of just do the things that I want to do because um, you know Tom and I were were having a hard time just coalescing our schedules to like do something, and he also still streams too um, in his community that he he has built in in his Discord. And he's a fantastic streamer. He's he's made for entertaining on a live camera. Uh, absolutely. So so he kind of does that. I kind of do this. And then our plan is to like come back together and kind of do some side questing once once we kind of get everything in life ironed out. But but yeah, it was it was more of just an experience of I wanted to to kind of attempt to do that solo thing on my own and be more comfortable about reaching out to people and just bringing people that I've never met face to face on and just talking to them about, about something I love. So that, that was really the whole catalyst behind that and to kind of just pursue my own creative endeavors. So, and I, I've got to say, I'm still a big fan of, of side questing. Um, so when that reunion reboot reprise <laughs> remaster, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. grand, a <laughs> grand resurrection from the ashes of the <laughs> phoenix however you want to handle it i i'm gonna be there i'm i'm mm -hmm. super excited about it you you know you mentioned um you know doing this solo to gain the skill set of talking to people um mm. my last show that i mentioned uh like a half hour ago my first one um was basically just a rip off of of Marin's show of mark Marin's show like mm. interviewing people down to the opening segment where it's just me talking <laughs> and like you know people don't realize it but talking to people performing on mic and interviewing people is a skill set like it's not mm. just as easy as getting up and talking it's i i don't you've you've found that right surely definitely it's because it's on on side yeah on side questing i didn't get a chance to have a lot of guests because I didn't want to just have people on the show without Tom and Tom didn't want to have people on the show without me because we wanted to do it together. So, and just with everyone's schedules, um, you know, Tom's manager would pretty much just make the schedule like the day before he had to like be into work and he was a real dick about it. Not to like spread Tom's personal life all over the internet, but uh, so it was just hard for all of us to like do that together. And I really wanted to see what, what that, and I didn't, I didn't want to disrespect him by like bringing people on the show and say, Hey, like I did this without you because it was something we started together. So that was, this format enables me to, to, to do that and kind of develop those skills. And, and it really is, it's just to try and make something sound organic and not just you're reading questions off of a, off of a cue card. And traditionally I'm the most introverted person, person and I hate talking to people. So it's been, it's been an experience for, for me to do this as well. And, yeah, side questing will be coming back. That's uh, I've gotten that question before. We just, you know, um, Tom's always had his streaming, so I want him to have the time to be able to devote to, to that and his community. Um, that's a completely different beast and different medium altogether. I've found, not to go off on a side tangent, because th you, you just taken over my show, Rick, so you can just finish the interview if you want to. <laughs> that's I've fine with you. I've flipped the yeah. tables. How the turn reverse, tables. Reverse, reverse. Um yeah, the I yeah. So streaming, uh, I I mean, I found that to be very, and maybe it was just the way I approached it, very like self self serving. Uh, you really had to sell yourself streaming more than you do podcast. Like the the podcasting community has been super great and super accepting, and just people willing to reach out and say, "Hey, like I took a chance and listened to your show." You used to have to like. It felt like making backroom deals with people to stream to get them to come watch your show. I'd be like, oh, yeah, hey, like I, I watched your show for like a half hour. Like you have to come watch mine now. It's like, you know, a, a, a trade for a trade type of deal. And it just you know, six months in, I got so burnt out on that. I was just like, uh, it's not worth it. So, yeah, kind of a little bit of history about that phase of my life that and I uh, almost exceeded the Internet uh, plan at my parents house. And they were like. 
hey, what are you doing up here? And I was like, well, I'm trying to do this. And they were just like, yeah, you're not doing that. Otherwise, you can move out. So and I didn't have the money to move out yet. So <laughs> shut down by mom and dad. <laughs> We've Ultimate. all been there. <laughs> yep. So um, awesome, Rick. Well, I'm like I said, I love the show. It's been in my weekly rotation ever since the Final Fantasy nine episodes. It's it's been it's been one of my things I look forward to every week. So uh Please, please don't stop anytime soon. I don't want you to. So uh, I hope you I hope you're around for a long time. Um, basically, I'm saying you have to do the show until like I die because, you know, it's, it's kind of the contract we've entered into now. So sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredibly sweet, man. I yeah. I can't tell you how how good that makes me feel and how much man that's I, I'm, I'm just so lucky to have found such a good group of, of, of people. Like in this our group is, video game podcasting community. Our group is crazy. I never would have expected to find such nice people on the internet, mostly because 95% of people on the internet are terrible. So <laughs> glad we found glad we found the good 5% of it. That's definitely a blessing for sure. from the show to talking just a little bit about you Rick so I hope you're comfortable talking about yourself uh, and I just want to kind of ask you personally where did your journey begin with video games what did that how did that kind of all come to be sure so the first the first console that I ever had I, I was born in <laughs> I was born it was a dark and stormy Wednesday <laughs> evening <laughs> In December of 92. Um, so so I, I, I was born in the early 90s. And the first console that I had, I, I remember this very distinctly, was um, my my dad had, I almost said dad at the time, and I was like, he's, he's still my dad. Why would I say that? <laughs> he um, just said this does not be my dad anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, is he, he got secondhand a Sega Saturn, um, I think from my uh. uncle. But... Um, and I was I wasn't even in kindergarten or I was in kindergarten. It was like so I I didn't know anything. It was the it I was getting bright stimulation into my eyes as a child. And that was just <laughs> enough for me. Um, but, you know, I, I remember growing up on games like Sonic 3D Blast, which, you know, maybe not the best game, but it was what I had. And um, right. Daytona Speedway, I want to say. And like, oh, wow. the, the original need for speed. Um, a game called Scud that I'd actually really like to cover for for our show. Um, just a classic kind of like on rails comic book shooter. But um, yeah, so that that was the first one, and I had that for a very long time um, before I got my uh, first quote unquote modern console, uh, PS One. Mm. And you know, I my, my my family was not going to just buy me like the PlayStation and the Nintendo and you know whatever whatever. So, um, me and my, my childhood best friend, um, he had an N64, I had a PS1. So we kind of helped each other out. You know, we would let each other borrow our systems. Uh, we would constantly hang out and play video games together. So that was sort of, you know, my childhood as far as games go. And then of course, you know, Pokemon on Game Boy, that was just everybody. It's, it is hard to overstate. Um, just how cool that was that literally everybody in school was playing Pokemon on a time before the internet. So it was like this, 
uh, this whole in group that, you know, we'll never get again because the internet has connected all of us. And I'm not saying that as a negative, right? Like I'm not, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not like taking a stand with Ted Kaczynski about the the modern technology, <laughs> um, at least not right now, but you know, it, it was a very special thing. So, um, largely PS one and, uh, game boy. That's where, that's where it all started. Yeah. I, I, talk to a couple people it seems like everybody i think i'm i'm one year earlier than you i was i was in 91 when i was born but yeah around that time um that that's something to this day that i still have not and i just think it was a, a combination of everything at the time pokemon coming out and just you know the prosperity of the the mid late 90s and yeah, that was the thing. That was the thing. It was, it was even my tiny brain back then could comprehend like what a firestorm that was. And, uh, I don't think we'll ever, because you said that the connectivity of the internet ruins everything, uh, for better or worse. Um, it's, it's great. It allows us to do this and it allows us to do a lot of good things, but, um, it's also a megaphone for the worst, worst of our species, unfortunately. Yeah, that was what I what I meant about about that comment just to just to further clarify is like it was really cool having a contemporary game like Pokemon that everybody was playing and everybody was figuring out at the same time together and we didn't have like Discord where we could just message somebody and say like hey is there really a Mew behind that truck and they'd be like lol nope <laughs> we didn't have that we just had to figure <laughs> right. it out and like you know at most we would have to call somebody on a landline to talk about it mm-hmm. You know, um, that, uh, so that's all I meant. It was, it was just, I, I love being connected. I love technology. It's, it's, mm. it's literally what I do for a living at the moment. It's, it's great, but it, it's just this very special feeling that we'll never have again because we're now all connected, you know, um, just exactly. super cool. It, just super cool. So, um, you know, it, it really was, it was on the playground being like, Oh, how did you find that? Or, or are you able to get to the truck or, or this and that? Yeah. And that, that's nowadays when a game comes out you have it literally a full playthrough of on youtube within five minutes of the game being out which is insane like you know people are speed running elden ring in 18 minutes a month after that game came out and it's just there's no there's just no mystery in it anymore <laughs> so but speed, yeah, speed I, runners are built different <laughs> i i i feel bad at video games when i watch speed runs it's it's ridiculous um so that's awesome and Obviously, that's kind of carried through your whole life, um, gaming, correct? Or has that kind of been a constant in, in your life? Uh, More or less? Did you kind of fall off well, at one time, come back to it? So, sort of, yeah. I mean, it, it's a great question um, because, I mean, you know, when, when you're talking to somebody that does a hobby uh, as often as we do, you're probably like, oh, you know, that's just ever since they've discovered it, it's been their thing. Um, but no, I there have been multiple times in my life where I've just fallen off of video games and stopped playing. Um, in particular, um, during the, oh, I always get the generations mixed up, but like the PS3, uh, Xbox 360, like that era, um, I largely just didn't play unless I was with a group of friends. Um, mm-hmm. that was, um, oh gosh, I, I want to say that was like right as I was ending high school and getting ready for undergrad. So I was like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I, I wasn't pretentious throughout undergrad, but like the first half of the first year and my whole senior year of high school, I was just a pretentious little jerk. Um, and I was like, <laughs> I only do music because that's the only thing that me, 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 me. And so like, I didn't really play. Um, and I think, honestly, I think Skyrim came out and that's when I got back into it. Um, mm-hmm. and then I just got busy to the point where I just didn't have time. And then, uh, Rocket League came out in grad school and I was like, oh, I kind of fell back into it. And then um, getting a gaming laptop, like towards the end of uh, grad school part two, that's kind of, you know, where I fell back in and started appreciating things at a different level. So it's been very on and off Um, with the exception of Pokemon, I guess I am not so much anymore, but I was for a while one of those people that just, oh, Pokemon put out the same thing, but with, you know, new Pokemon, buy it, you know, buy it, play it, got to. Yeah, I feel that. Uh, it's been more so of a constant in my life, but I, I definitely feel you on that. I had a point I was going to make, but I totally forgot what it was now. Oh, I was going to say, I think looking back then, uh, we were probably all pretentious little jerks in high school uh, to, to some degree. 
I know that one of the saving graces of of Facebook has been its memories feature because it allows me to see what I posted in days past and then just scrub it and delete it forever. And I read some of the stuff that I used to say and I was just like, man, if I could go back in time, I would probably slap me like this. This kid was annoying. <laughs> so, oh, oh, dude, same, same, man. I was like <laughs> I was one of those kids in high school that would post multiple times a day. And I'm just going back through and it's like, oh, my God, dude, like, what shut are you up. doing? Get Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that's uh, very impressive that you used a thesaurus just to post this one, you know, status just to use a fancy word. That's very you're so smart. Right. So exactly. Smart. I was I was really big into sports back in that and stuff. And uh, now, especially since it's the time of March Madness, I was like, hey, on this day in 2013, why did you do 18 Facebook statuses about the March Madness games? Like, nobody cares. <laughs> Call, like, stop. <laughs> that Nobody cares. <laughs> Please stop. So, uh, yeah, I feel you on that. Is there, to you, I know it's not, e- it, this isn't an easy question, uh, so I normally don't limit it to one, but is there a game or a couple games that, um, I, we touched on a little bit, but is, is there a couple of games that you would consider your favorite games of all time that have connected with you emotionally that mean something special to you? Yeah, 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 of course. Um, Well, the one that I kind of already threw off was um, Disco Elysium. I, it's one of those, I forget where I said this last, it might have been on the list off show, but it's one of those games for me that's like, I know I'm not, I, I might not ever have that experience again, just playing through a game that resonated with me so deeply and personally. Um, and that I felt was so perfect. Like everything about that game is what I, what I look for in a video game. So it was a very, very moving experience. Um, and you know, for better or for worse, a lot of the themes that it explores, um, hit home in a very real way. So it was like, uh, it, it, it's difficult to sort of describe. There were several times where I would just get through a heavy scene and just turn off the game. And it's like, I, I really just need time to process what just happened because it's, it's just that kind of experience. That's definitely one for me. Um, another one that I always mention, um, is final fantasy nine, just because, you know, I, I played through that game so many times over the years. Um, steam alone, I've got like 120 hours. Then I did a switch playthrough, and then that's not counting PS one. Um, wow. but yeah, it's just one of those games I, I I know so well, and it kind of sparked what I look for in games. You know, I I like narrative. I really appreciate narrative. I like turn based. I'm I am in the minority, I think these days, but I prefer turn based to the like action RPG that Final Fantasy fifteen went with, and even frankly, Final Fantasy seven remake. Um, and it just shaped a lot of, and obviously the music is just oh my god, it's just it's it's so top tier. You don't have to tell me. Oh, man, it's so good. <laughs> oh, dude, uh, Nobuo Umatsu, Koji Kondo, um, and the Zeno composer, who I always forget their name, um, but I don't want to butcher it by guessing, so I won't. But those three, oh, man, just so good. But it, it's largely those two. Um, Disco is my favorite game of all time. I wouldn't call Final Fantasy IX my favorite JRPG. I, I think that would go to Persona 3, um, which is just an, j- just a phenomenal game. Although Xenogears might, you know, give it a run for its money. Um, mm-hmm. Final Fantasy IX is certainly my favorite Final Fantasy. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's it. And, you know, of course, I, I have to also give major, you know, recognition to, like like we talked about, Pokemon, just because it brought together so many kids, you know, really from elementary through high school. Um, and sometimes beyond to, you know, together with that experience. So even though I'm not a fan anymore, it wouldn't be fair for me to say, you know, that that wasn't a pivotal franchise for me. That, that looms large just because of growing up with time. If, if you grew up in that time period with us, that, that was something that will always loom large. That's just, that's how it is. It was such a cultural force at the time. There'll never be anything like that again, but yeah, I, I feel you on, on those um, I know, I just know from, you know, doing the show with my co-host Tom, doing side questing that, uh, Persona's reputation, uh, precedes itself definitely. And that's something that I've very much regret missing out on in, in my gaming experiences. Oh, you've never played any of them. I've never played any of them. No. So that's, that's Ooh. to somebody who says they love RPGs and JRPGs so much. That's something I have very much shame that I have never played those before. 
And I'm finding it difficult now just because life has gotten so busy to sit down and want to commit the time to something like Persona 5 that's 100 hours long. So even yeah, though I know I would even though I know I would love it because literally everything I've heard about it and everybody that has played it has said it's amazing. And I, and I know just based on my taste that I would love it. It's just it's hard. Well, to no commit shame that at all. Time. It's it's time is our most precious resource. Right. And mm-hmm. I, I feel like I that resonates in my bones more every 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 day. And mm-hmm. those games are a lot. Um, the saving grace is like since they're the way they're structured, you know, they you could get by like playing them like maybe once a week or so. May I give you a suggestion? Yes. If absolutely. you're going to start with one of the Neo Persona, quote unquote Neo Persona games, that is three, four, five. Start with four golden. Um, it's okay. accessible on Steam. Pretty much anything could run it. It's not difficult to run. It is, in my opinion, the weakest. Uh, although I think. I would say it it has the strongest characters, but it 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 is overall the weakest, even though it's still like a crazy good experience. Mm-hmm. Um, toss up whether you want to go three or five after that. Uh, I went three and then five. Uh, I, I love them both, but you know, starting with four is a good spot because if you if you don't dig four, then you know three and five might be hit or miss for you. Yeah, and I I think I would definitely would. I, I know I would dig it just for the type of stuff that I've played. Um, it's just, yeah, I, I just kind of missed it. And I, I honestly had never heard of the series until the buzz around five just kind of built. And all of a sudden everyone was just like, it was kind of accepted fact that Persona 5 was like now the de facto JRPG of our time right now. And so then it was like, well, I've kind of already missed the train on it. And but yeah, I think. I'm definitely gonna have to go back and play those. I I couldn't call myself a RPG fan if I if I didn't. So that's that's great advice. So I think I will I will definitely take that into consideration when I'm ready to like sit down and and tackle that that challenge for sure. I so, I know you called me out earlier for flipping the script on you, but I I gotta ask if you're okay with answering. Is there is there a game that means that much to you over the years? Um. So yes. Uh. A few. Um. Obviously, like I said, Final Fantasy IX is a big one. Um, that was the first ever RPG that I played. That was kind of my first ever introduction to kind of like story based game that 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 style of game. Uh, that's a big one to me just because of the themes that it tackles. Uh, you know, if you're not paying attention, I at first, I, you know, nine is at the tail end of that PS1 era and it, it kind of gets dismissed sometimes. But it really does have a lot of touching themes about it's the most human story in my opinion about life and death and just those kind of themes loom very large in that game and it's just it's so human in its story and it's so um just it's regular ragtag group of characters it's not you know ex-soldiers or mercenaries or just these larger than life people it's just they're they're regular normal people in that story that kind of just get caught up in in a bigger you know just just bigger narrative and every single Final Fantasy after that, it's just not really like that. You know, it has larger than life characters. It has, you know, princes or, or super soldiers or just that kind of narrative. It's just, it's so human in its story that I just love it so much. And then obviously the other being um, Kingdom Hearts, that that series I devoted 18 years of my life to uh, by the time three came out. And again, that game has so much meaning to me because it's a game that doesn't really deserve to exist. It's such a weird idea. It's Final <laughs> Fantasy and Disney. It's it's the biggest kind of entity in Japan and the biggest entity in the West that coming together to put out something that's just so bizarre that's not necessarily well written, not necessarily well voice acted, but it, it the game is so well put together and and just it's just the the game has so much heart for bad pun, right? Kingdom Hearts got a lot of heart. That's a terrible pun. So um, that that game to me has always been a game I've went back to in, in hard times. And, and it's just very much like a comforting blanket to, to me, um, just because all those characters represent some kind of, um, you know, some kind of emotion, whether it's just, you know, um, joy or ever present optimism in Soara or, uh, re- you know, the redemption in Riku story or, or just things like that. It's just a lot of great lessons from that game. So. Those those are the two big ones, big ones for me for sure. 
So you will question. be happy to know that we are covering Kingdom Hearts here uh, in May. May and June, we're doing like a a, a two month two parter. Um, I'm excited to revisit it. I haven't played it since I was um, oh golly, uh, not in any serious way since high school. So mm-hmm. I'm a, and I saw your schedule you put out. I'm very I'm very excited to listen to those. So um, you know, it's that was something I used to obsess over obsessively in the lead up to, to three it was the most obsessive I've ever been about a thing ever just kind of that that community is very very obsessive over trying to figure out what's next it's looking for clues looking for little hints looking you know um you can spend hours going down the kingdom hearts fan theory youtube hole it's very dangerous because it, it's insane um so yeah just be careful if you if you go down that journey for sure so <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm excited to listen to you guys talk about it because I love anybody that does an episode in Kingdom Hearts. I'll be there day one, instantly download, listen to that for sure. So, <laughs> and um, shameless plug: if you ever do any other games in the series, uh, give me a, give me a call. I'd love to uh, come on and talk for sure. <laughs> I we'd be happy to have you. I don't think Ben has played any of them, and neither have I. So okay, awesome. That's great. Uh, so getting a couple of my last questions here. I just kind of wanted to talk to you about um, anybody that's listened to your show knows that you are um, educationally trained musician. I don't know if that's the proper term. Um, you said you do have one graduate degree, several graduate degrees in, in fields of music. Is that correct? <laughs> oh boy. Um, I, so Am I, I putting you my... on the spot? I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's just more like uh, how much I... I'm looking at the question and the follow-up um, says, uh, you know, I want to know what that is like. And I'm thinking, oh, God, like, how much time do you have um, <laughs> <laughs> to, to answer your question? I, I do have my undergraduate in uh, music education and my master's and my doctorate in saxophone performance. Um, wow. Te- yeah. Technically, Dr. Firestone, I, I do not whip that out outside of music related, <laughs> you know, happenings because there's just no reason to, uh, but I did earn it. So it's there. Um, and Dr. Firestone say, sounds badass. If you ask me, I got to say super villain, baby. It's like the best. <laughs> there you super, go. It's, it's a super villain name. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I was talking, uh, there was, I, I was teaching a young student, like a elementary or middle school student. And I, I mentioned that and I was like, doesn't that sound like a superhero name? And they were like, yeah, or maybe a mayor. And I was like, did you just downgrade <laughs> me to a mayor? Um, but yes, it would look I, good I, on, a, I, on a political sign, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I, I would be the worst mayor. Um, but you yes, I, evil mayor. I do. I do have those. Um, I, I have also made the decision to not pursue that as my full time uh, career these days. Um, I, I don't know how much you want to get into that, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm open to talking about it if you'd like you can tell me as much or little as you want so that's why i bring people on the show so sure um well the the tldr if you will um there were a couple of you know it's not covid related believe it or not i did finish up school during covid like i was virtual my entire last semester like doing literally wow literally eric my my um final defense like my my doctoral defense i was in a suit a shirt a tie and boxers <laughs> because it was virtual yeah <laughs> you know um but it, it it's actually not related to that there were there were a couple of reasons that sort of you know made me make the decision um you know the two two of them are personal in a way but like more so it would just take a lot of explaining um but the biggest That's one fine more than like that constituted more than 50% of my, you know, desire to make this decision is just the field of academia right now is, um, can we swear on this show? Yeah, absolutely. It's explicit. So go ahead. It's fucking broken, dude. It's, it's so fucking broken. And I, I, I I just, I, I had this thought, you know, growing up in high school, our teachers and like college professors would say, you know, we, we don't do this for the money. You know, you'll make a living, but, you know, you're, you're not going to be rich. And we were all like, yeah, you know, like, that makes sense. But what, I don't think what anybody had the foresight to realize is just how much that would grow exponentially. I don't think I'm using exponentially right, but it would just be so 
intensely magnified by the time we were in the field. Um, mm -hmm. And at, at this point, Eric, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I have so many friends that I know personally that are either, you know, e either in my situation and had just graduated or had been working that just left the field for these exact reasons. Um, and I, I just had this moment where I was like, you know, it's, do I want to just be mentally and emotionally drained constantly? Maybe, you know, get two adjunct positions, um, adjunct being part-time for higher education with no benefits and no job security and also bust my ass practicing, uh, performing, teaching on the side, marketing, all the, all this stuff to maybe scrape 30 K a year and then hope to get, get your foot in the door as they tell you for a big position, you know, a big position at like 50 K I had this moment and I was like, that's, that's absurd. And, mm. you know, like I said, I'm, I, I'm boiling this down, like, um, not to be, not in a reductive way, but like, I, I'm boiling it down to just the, the basics. Cause I don't want to take up too much of your time, but, but, but them's the fact, like it's, it's a broken field. Um, it's going to implode. If, if things do not change, it is going to collapse in onto itself. Um, it just needs such a restructuring, like, like the, the whole field, not just music, like academia in general just needs torn down. Um, you know, the pay that they give the teachers, um, like the job security, the amount of work that professors are asked to do, um, often by higher ups that are just not teachers or not even in the field. It's, and don't even, don't even get me started on student loans. I think we should cancel them all. But um, just the whole thing, I really think just needs to be fundamentally restructured. And I worry that that's not going to happen. Um, however, you know, not to, to end on an upward note, not on a negative note. Um, and this came from talking to a lot of people because at the time I was like having an identity crisis and I was like depressed. I was like, you know, what, what does my life even mean <laughs> at this point? Um, which is not healthy to attach your self image and self worth to one particular pursuit. Very unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Um, and somebody was like, you know, she she was a doctor of music. She left her adjunct teaching gig to do coding, software development. And she was like, you know, I'm never going to be less of an expert at music. And, you know, getting my clarinet chops, she's a clarinet player, getting my clarinet chops up to where they were at their peak would only ever take two months of of diligent practicing. It's not a skill set that we lose. And that's kind of where I'm sitting too. Like like I will always be an expert. I know how to listen. I know what I'm, you know, looking for. I will always remember how to play. Um, and sometimes I do, as, as you saw on Instagram, I did a little ditty of Traverse of the Traverse town theme. Mm -hmm. Um, beautiful by the way, it was beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, the acoustics in that room did half of the work, did all the heavy lifting. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, it was one of those things where, you know, it, Mentally, emotionally, financially, I just could not see it happening. And there were a few other factors, not going to get into them, but that's, that's the long and short of it. Um, and it did lead to my favorite joke that oftentimes makes people uncomfortable whenever they hear about it because they don't know what to say is I, I love telling them, you know, yeah, you know what job three degrees in music gets you? Amateur video game podcaster. <laughs> Uh, more often than not, people just don't know what to say. So I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad that you're laughing. I no, I, I, um, I don't have the level of education that you do, but I, I relate to a lot of the things that I've me personally, uh, not to, not to get into like too much crazy political stuff here, but, um, it's baffling to me that we expect so much of the people that we entrust to prepare the next generation with knowledge and give them so little like that's that's baffling to me like truly and it's it's like that for a lot of you know positions across and the pandemic has only amplified that it's a it's for that a lot of positions across the board that we consider quote unquote essential but we also want to commit the least amount of resources to it's it's baffling to me it, it really is and i don't i don't understand it 
I, I remember reading a statistic one time that like in all 50 states, the top federal employee in each state is a college football coach. And I'm like, that's that's bullshit completely. Like, I understand college sports are important, but like we need to. Why? Why? Why is that the people that are teaching and imparting knowledge to people? I cannot think of a more important pursuit than that, because as we can see, given the current political climate of the last few years, uh, knowledge and facts are very, very important. <laughs> so we probably yeah. need to be investing more in that. <laughs> Just kind of my off the top of my head thoughts about that. So yeah, that that it's it's infuriated me seeing yeah. how some not all but a very vocal minority um, of the public just treats the uh, the idea of being learned and and knowledge it's 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 so infuriating um yeah. to go back to your th thing about football um one i did one of my degrees at the university of georgia um i loved it there very much um and it's, it's one of the it's one of the yeah one of the bigger football schools in the sec and don't get me wrong the music department had money they mm. did but it would shock you if you would learn like Oh, we just didn't have an organ, like an entire musical instrument, like an entire field of study. We didn't really have one. And then go look at our football field, our, right. our like multi-million dollar football field. It is bananas. I, and, and I came from a small town. So like that was brand new to me. I was like, holy moly, like this is yeah. crazy. I didn't. My high school didn't even have football where I went. But uh, I, I, we experienced something similar. So UIC, um, where I went to, didn't have a football program either. My last year there, we ended up getting classes shut down for a few years or a few weeks my last year because um, the teachers went on strike because they wanted a raise and they hadn't gotten a raise in a few years. And it came to light that the University of Illinois, at least the Chicago portion of it, um, was just sitting on two billion dollars in the bank that they just weren't doing anything with. They weren't doing anything with it. They were just they were just hanging on to it. And it's like you can't give your professors and you know all these people doing all this work a, a raise. You haven't given them a raise in two years. Like that's outrageous. And then professors starting to threaten withhold grades and not let us graduate. And I'm like, hey, hey, whoa, like don't don't look. I'm, I'm just I just want to get out of here. That's my last year. Like come on, <laughs> like just let's settle this peacefully. But um, yeah, it's it's stupid. It's dumb that the, the way that is, it's absolutely outrageous. And it, yeah, it does need to be fixed. It's a, it's a big problem. Um, not to, not to be it in too far away from games, but it's, it's baffling to me. It's just things you think should be common sense. Aren't common sense. It's stupid. So things that, um, you, I mean, to, to pivot back to something that you said, like, we're not trying to get overtly political here, but like things that you think shouldn't be politicized are, are, Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame. hundred percent. So, um, so going in, um, you had since you have such a high level of, of education and degree. Um, I myself, I personally, I played saxophone for nine years uh, throughout middle school and high school. Kind of fell off in college just because I just fell away from it, and it's one of the things I definitely regret. But um, do you have any? Um, you know, I'll just, I'll just let you gush here a little bit. Uh, non gaming and gaming. Do you have any? Um, music that you really like i, mean, I know you mentioned one of your favorite pieces earlier um do you have anything like that or anything that you would you would recommend that is is you just think is really great oh i would um i'll save the <laughs> gaming for last just so we can kind okay. of come full circle um oh, and i've thought about this a lot so awesome. i wanted to <laughs> i love I it i wanted to um you know give one like i've got three albums that i'm just ready to talk about uh Perfect. super quickly one saxophone one classical music but not saxophone and one just you know uh quote unquote popular music so here we go um the the saxophone related one the the uh, saxophone related one is sort of um just I, I guess it's not an album it's um it's a group called the prism quartet p-r-i-s-m and it's i mean it's it's certainly the premier saxophone quartet in the United States, but they're also international artists. Um, and I, I, I studied with one of them, uh, the alto player. Uh, he, he was my last teacher. Um, just incredible if you ever want to. And, and the cool thing is, is they do tons of, um, interdisciplinary media. So like they collaborate with jazz musicians, uh, jazz saxophonists, like Coltrane's son. That was, they did something with him. Um, jazz pianists. They just did like 
a whole musical theater play type thing that was super cool i they're just always doing wild stuff so um shout out to them the um the now we got two albums the non saxophone music album uh one of my favorite albums of all time is glenn gould uh pianist playing the goldberg variations and now he's got two uh different recordings of this one in the mid 50s and one in the early 80s i want to say um and they're both phenomenal but it's uh, first of all that's one of my favorite pieces of all time but um the later one is one is probably my favorite album of all time because it's such you know he's playing the same piece but it's it's like hearing a different experience he's he's approaching it with just the weight of life and it's very reflective and pensive almost like he's looking back on <laughs> i'm gonna get choked up here he's looking back like on all of his accomplishments as a musician and as a human um and man it's just it's it's one of those albums that i cannot listen to unless that's all i'm doing like it it cannot be background noise because it's just it just demands attention. It grabs you. And it's, mm. and it's just one man and 88 keys on the piano. It, it's so insane to me. Um, but anyway. And then um, one album that I think probably more people will have heard of. My favorite band, aside from the Beatles, my favorite band, period. Uh, the Mountain Goats, led by John Darnielle. My favorite album of theirs, for sure, uh, All Hail West Texas. Just just chef's kiss i mm-hmm. it, it's it's difficult for me to uh you know if you don't know the mountain goats it's largely john darniel but he's added members uh to the band as he's gone this particular album is just john darniel playing and singing playing guitar and singing um and it's recorded in like it's almost like it's recorded in 480p like it's a very lo-fi kind of sound um and it's just songs about people and um, the thing is, is that John was like a, a an English major, so he's a very, very good writer. Um, yeah, I just, man, I love the Mountain Goats so much. I just discovered <laughs> them in like 2020, and they've been going since the 90s. So I've been like just devouring the backlog. It's It's been awesome. That's awesome. It's, it's been so cool. I love having a backlog of stuff that I haven't played or heard or read from like <laughs> the 80s up until now. It's like, right. oh, I'm going to be busy forever. It's great. <laughs> that's awesome um i'm definitely gonna like i said i'm i'm nowhere near the level you are so i'm gonna take all those recommendations definitely give all those things a listen because that that sounds um just hearing how emotional you were talking about um you're getting talking about those things that that's fantastic um do you have anything kind of do you have anything video game related that you're that you really like that obviously we talked talked about uh umatsu the master of course um anything anything else that kind of catches you yeah yeah the final fantasy 9 soundtrack specifically from umatsu mm. that's that might be my favorite at least of final fantasy that he's done yeah it, it, it reportedly it was his too he said it was his favorite work so i mean can't argue with that <laughs> yeah it's 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 just i love the way that he uses the um the the character themes what we call light motifs just the the music that describes a character and how it comes Mm. back in different forms and iterations whenever they're going, you know, quote unquote, when they're going through it, you know, VV in Mm -hmm. particular, um, Steiner's theme is another great one. I just, that, that whole game is just perfect. Um, Mm -hmm. persona, like all of persona has good music. I particularly like persona three. It's kind of like persona four is like pop and it's good pop. Don't get me wrong. Persona five, People on the internet call it jazz, but that's just because it has syncopation and a piano. It is not jazz at all. Right. It's like <laughs> it's like pop rock that sometimes has a little bit of jazzy elements. But mm-hmm. Persona 3 is like this really cool mix of jazz, funk, and rap. And it's like, um, it, it, yeah, it's just so cool. Um, very kind of of the time, like early two thousands in your face. Um, it's, it's great. And then, um, the last one, Disco Elysium, uh, largely from the catalog of the band British Sea Power, Mm -hmm. uh, which I, who I learned about from that game. They're great, man. Like they're, they're really, really good. It's like, 
they live in the gray area between like music that demands your attention and music that you just put on in the background to vibe. They're like Mm -hmm. kind of in the middle where sometimes they work as both. Um, And that horn line from Disco Elysium mm, just gets me every time. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm, I know, obviously, the play along guys just did disco, and I've heard multiple people this year talk about disco. So I think that's definitely going to be something I have to go and experience because um, it sounds incredible. Uh, for me, yeah, I mean, you touched on it, um, Uematsu, and I, like I said, I'm not, I, I don't have the same knowledge as you do, but uh, just the way he uses music in in Nine and so many kind of different things he does too. I mean hell there's like a flamenco song in there and that's just (laughs) insane to think about like it's it's absolutely nuts to the different styles of music that that he uses in in that soundtrack um other than that uh the one that's had the biggest impact on my life is uh for all of the things that kingdom hearts has going against it uh kingdom hearts sound design i think is unrivaled uh not not just its music also just its sound effects that are iconic um but the entire breadth of work for the entire franchise over the last 20 years by Yoko Shimomura is unbelievable. Absolutely stunning. Um, the way that she intertwines themes into different songs kind of lightly, like you'll just be listening to a, a piece and then like Sora's theme will show up in there or just the way that she just lightly intersperses themes from different songs into songs to make something like entirely new. It's, it's, it's stunning like songs you won't have heard for like the entire series and then all of a sudden they come back and you're like oh yeah like i i remember that it's it, it's unbelievable um yeah her music's incredible uh she's she's fantastic it's by by far the sound the, the soundtrack i go go back to um the most definitely didn't um, she compose a super mario rpg as well i think so and i think she i'm gonna get this wrong i know i i want to say she worked on some Capcom stuff too in the early days as well. I, I don't. You can't quote me on that though. But um, yeah, I, I think she did work on, on Mario RPG, and she's worked. Uh, she did some work on Final Fantasy 15 as well, and and some of the other Final Fantasies. But um, yeah, she's she's a force and absolutely absolutely stunning. I wanted to share with you um one of my personal music stories. If if you got one more moment um oh, from yeah, when I I've got from, so many yeah. moments. From from when uh, I just saying that because my my wife is texting me that she's hungry, so I'm running on a limited timer once that happens. <laughs> um, but when I was I I played uh, alto saxophone uh, for nine years in middle school and high school, and um, I went to a, a private Lutheran school that was part of a, a church synod. And every year the the synod had a a band fest where they'd take people from all the schools come together, and you do have like a week of of music and you'd have a concert at the end with all the people from across the country. And um, I was very fortunate to get to, to participate in that. My, my senior year, I was like second chair alto sax, I think. And um, that was an incredible experience because one of, one of the pieces we got to, so this is one of my most vivid memories of, of music ever. And just reminds me of the power of music in general. We, we played a piece called Epinesian by john paulson i believe it was um are you familiar with that piece at all you know not not off the top of my head okay um it's, so it's i'm gonna have our time describing it because i i'm and i'm a little bit nervous i'm trying to describe it to a to a master so um it's a piece of music that doesn't really have any kind of direction um it doesn't really have like a key it's it's very it's a very distressing piece of music to listen to it's it's um, when he originally wrote it, like it was so distressing that people would just leave in the middle of the performance because uh, really it's just like a collection of sounds that the instruments make with one central theme being repeated louder and louder throughout the piece. And it's supposed to represent like a growing movement towards change out of like the cacophony of just everyday sound and noise. And it just builds to like this loud, loud conclusion at the end where it's just it's it's so disconcerting to listen to that it makes you uncomfortable i was uncomfortable playing to it and performing it um but after that you know we we performed that piece and then then there was silence for about 10 15 seconds so the crowd could take it in and then we moved into um a hymn it is well with my soul which is a very calming kind of you know it's 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 a it's a church hymn that is supposed to be very comforting so the transition from this chaotic piece that's 
almost uncomfortable and stressful and anxious to listen to, to this beautiful hymn that's comforting was um, incredible by the director to make the, those music choices, but just the effect it had, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. Everybody was just, just crying because it was so powerful and so moving. Um, and so I just wanted to share that with you because I figured, um, you know, you, you out of everybody I've talked to would appreciate that, that memory that I had. Um, yeah. So if, if you had a chance to go get to listen to that piece, Epinesi, and it's very, it's very distressing to listen to that. So <laughs> no, man, that's, I mean, that's beautiful. It's mm -hmm. it, it, this, this notion of, of taking these polar opposites, um, you know, feelings of distress, turmoil, um, hopelessness, and then combining them with pieces like hymns that are the exact opposite, just about feelings of hope and um, rebirth and things like that. That's that's part of what makes programming and indeed music so beautiful. And and you described it well. Like it's you know to go back to video game critiquing. It's we some as you're learning to critique video games, it's just like learning what to look for. It's the exact same with music, man. It's mm -hmm. not like it's not a gatekeeping thing where the educated can be like, Oh, you just don't get it because you don't have that pedigree. It's not, it's just like once you are shown once, literally once what like, okay, you're used to listening to a melody instead of listening for that, put on a different hat and just listen to how the different timbres interact with each other then it opens up a world of possibilities. And it's, again, to connect it to games, it's the same thing. Once you, like, know, once you're privy to look for different things rather than just tap, tap, tap the button, mm -hmm. then it's a whole new world. And you only need to be shown once. And then you just go from there. So, no, you did a great job of explaining it. That sounds like a moving experience, truly. Um, and, yeah, man, I, I love hearing stories of music from people that are not uh currently involved in it that just stuck with them for years mm -hmm. it's fantastic it's something i definitely want to go back to if i if i get a little more free time here for sure But Rick, thank you so much for uh, let me take some time out of your day and just come sitting down and talk with me. This was this was awesome, man, and I I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I I'm definitely gonna ask you to come back on, and um, I may or may not be making an appearance on your show later in the year. Very excited for that. Not to not to spoil anything, but uh, definitely looking forward to coming on and talking to you, Ben, uh, about some video games. Um, do you just want to take a minute here to just kind of plug your show where everybody can find you? Yeah. Yeah. And thank you once again. This is, I've been looking forward to this pretty much ever since we met. Uh, and mm -hmm. since I realized that you, you know, invite guests on from time to time. So this has been great. Um, pixel project radio, you can get us wherever you listen. Um, we play through games and then we talk about it book club style. Uh, it's sort of like the podcast stuff you should know, but about video games. Um, and we're not as funny, but you know, we're, we're, we're charming enough. I think I think the jokes have been great. You've made some pretty good ones that have made me chuckle for sure. So um, yeah, I'll link all the stuff in the show notes if you want to find them. All the all their socials, all that good stuff. Um, Pixel Project Radio, definitely a great listen. Definitely a great conversation about video games. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, ten out of ten masterpiece for sure. So make sure you go listen. Um, but Rick, thanks again, man. I appreciate it, and uh, I'll definitely be in touch with you to come on again here in the near future for sure. So. Um, yeah, everybody, thank you so much for listening as always. Appreciate it. Um, my stuff, you know, my stuff, it's linked in the show notes. You can find it. I'm not going to repeat it because I'm way too lazy. So just, um, yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. And, uh, have a good day.
Thank you.